All right, Mark chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 35. When you have it, say faith. Faith. I want to talk to you and close out our series on faith. And it reads this way. At verse 35, it says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. And in the NIV, it says, A furious squall came up, or a storm, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped or filled with water. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we drown? How many know he does care? In verse 39, the Bible says, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the winds died down, and it was completely calm. But then notice what he said to his disciples. How many know here in the Scripture we see that Jesus was always training his disciples? How many feel like this year God's been training you? Well, look what the Lord said to his disciples here. He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In another version, it says, where is your faith? Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and ask him that question. Where is your faith? Amen. Give him a high five. Tell him they look good. And you may be seated this morning. This will be the last sermon uh, that we speak on the subject of faith as we close out our series. And as we close it out, I want to take a look at how Jesus grew the faith of his disciples. How many would like to learn about that? I want to look at how Jesus grew the faith of his disciples. How many of you want to have a growing faith? Uh, when I think about faith, I think about parenting. And I'm a parent. Are there any parents out there? And I'm becoming a veteran at parenting. I have what's called a parenting career now. Because I've been raising kids for 20 years. How about you? And I think one of the most challenging times of raising children is, is, is for me, I don't know about you, but for me is when my kids become ill. How many know it's kind of scary? And, you know, I've always been pretty hands-on when the kids get sick. You know, I, I'll go to the doctor with them. I'll take them. I'll diagnose them. I'll take their temperature. I'll do what I have to do. And I've always been pretty hands-on in taking the kids to the doctor. But how many know that? Whenever your kids get sick, you got to take them to the doctor. It's pretty stressful. Are, are you one of those parents like me that when your kids get sick, you get really stressed out? I get stressed out. I, I really do. And I think what stresses me out, I, I especially get stressed out when I don't know what's happening with them. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a parent who acts like a doctor. Talk to me, somebody. And I don't know what's happening to them. And so when we get to the doctor, what happens? You know, you're all stressed out. You're all on edge. Talk to me now. You're kind of, you got to take off work. You got to do what you got to do. You get over there. You're stressed out. And then you're a little bit in a hurry, right? You're kind of in a hurry. You're like, what's going on with this kid? I want to know what's going on. I need me some information. Come on. Am I, is my child going to live or die? Talk to me, somebody. <laughs> and you're in a hurry. And you stress yourself out. You get over there, and you got whatever you have in your hand. You go up, and what do they tell you? They tell you you're going to have to wait. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Talk to me now. And then you go sit in that long waiting room. Isn't it horrible? You're in that long waiting room. you got to fill out all these horrible long sheets of paper. And you don't even have a pen. Borrow their pen. You're filling out the paper. You're giving them all your information. You're stressed out. You don't know what's going on. And they tell you to wait. And then right finally they call your name, Mr. Valdez, Mr. Jones, Mr. Gonzalez, Mrs. Gonzalez. You get up. You grab your sick kid. You go through the door. And then what do they do? You don't see the doctor. You see the nurse. <laughs> By that time, your patience is totally gone. And what do they do? You see the nurse and... Then they begin to uh, uh, tell you to wait a little bit more. And then by that time, your patience is worn out. And I remember one time when I was so stressed out with my daughter, I kind of lost my cool. Has anyone ever lost their cool in a public place? 
come on the bank or at, you know, at a restaurant or at the doctor's office. I kind of lost my cool, man. And I said, listen, you know, they're, they're weighing my daughter. I got on this guy. I said, why do we got to go through all this? Why can't we just be, see the doctor? I was stressed out. But what the nurse said next, watch this, not only corrected me, but gave me important information about future visits. And I lost my cool, but then the nurse said to me, Mr. Valdez, we have to weigh your daughter because we have to compare her height and compare her weight to her last visit. Because if she's not growing, then we know something's wrong. And friends, here's the simple yet profound truth about faith is that if we're not growing, then we know something's wrong. Mm. Growth is always a sign of spiritual health. And here's something I believe each and every one need to know, is that it's God's will to grow our life. Can you talk to your neighbor this morning and tell him, it's God's will to grow our life. It's God's will to grow us. And if we're not growing in our faith, then we must recognize that there must be something wrong with our spiritual health. Let's talk about God's sovereign will for a moment, because how many, know, how many of you want to do God's will? Yes. How many of you want to live in God's will? Yes. How many know that there's blessing in God's will? Yes. Then let's talk about God's will for a moment. And, and listen to me when I tell you this, is that it is God's will for you to grow. It's God's will to grow you. Write this down. It's God's will to groom you. In other words, to polish you up, to take off the rough edges. Say amen. See, it's God's will to grow you. It's God's will to groom you. It's God's will to guide you. Part of growth is when you stop doing your own thing. It's God's will to grow you. It's God's will to groom you. It's God's will to guide you. And it's God's will to be glorified by you. That the ultimate purpose of why God grows us is because God seeks to get glory out of our life. There are people here this morning that before you had Christ, you were giving the devil all the glory. Is this too strong for you? Our lives gave the devil all the glory. The world got all the glory. Education got the glory. A relationship got the glory. Money got the glory. Skills got the glory. But the minute you stepped out of darkness and you stepped into his marvelous light, God says, I want to get the glory because I'm the God that rescued you. I'm the God that healed you. I'm the God that pulled your feet out of the miry clay. And how many know he deserves all the Oh, man, he deserves all the glory. He wants to grow you. He wants to groom you. He wants to guide you. He wants to get the glory out of our life. But in order to do it, watch this. Sometimes he makes you sit in the waiting room of faith. And it's when he gets you in the waiting room. This is the word for Someone may not like this right now, but that's all right. You need to hear it. Because things aren't going your way. Things aren't working in your favor. You feel like it's not working in your favor. But I want to tell you, quite possibly, you're in the waiting room of faith. And God will put you in the waiting room of faith so that he can prescribe to you what you need to grow. And here's the key. Go back. Flash back. To the, to the doctor's office. Put yourself back in the doctor's office with the kid. Flash back for a moment. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait because we think the longer we wait, something's wrong. Some of you thought I forgot where I was in my point. No, I'm just making you wait. 
I know what I'm doing and God knows what he's doing. He puts us in the waiting room because he wants to see where we're at so he can give us what we need so that he can take our life to the next level. Is there anyone here that wants to go to the next level of faith? Then you're going to have to learn how to wait on God. Touch your neighbor, tell him, just wait. And here's what I kind of feel like. For some of us that we love to come to church, let me, let me tell you, I kind of feel like every time we walk into this house, every time we walk into this place, God is checking our height and our weight. The minute you walked in, you saw that greeter, God was already checking your height. In fact, he might have checked you in the parking lot when you couldn't find a parking space. He was checking your height and your weight. What is the level of your faith today? What kind of week did you have? What kind of year has it been? Every time we come to this place, he's checking our height and he's checking our weights. And when he checks it, then he wants to see what we need. That's why the person next to you may get something out of this sermon and you might get something different. Because we all weigh different. We all think different. We're all going through different seasons of our life. He's checking our height and he's checking our weight. And then when he sees where we're at, then he begins to prescribe to us what we need. That's why sometimes he, he, he'll, he'll come into church and he'll, he'll look at your situation. He'll look at your height and weight and say, boy, he says, that girl needs a little bit of joy. So then the pastor gets up here and says, some of you need to give God praise. I'm not giving God no praise. And then the preacher doesn't give up. No, give him praise. No, come on and shout. Because the God knows that you need to live a life of joy and stop being defeated and stop having your head down in the dumps and stop having a poor me mentality. He, he watches us. He checks our height and our weight. Sometimes he says, you need a little bit uh, of my word. Come on, somebody. That's why he'll say, stand for the reading of my word, because you need the word. Amen. You need the word in, in, in your life. Sometimes he'll prescribe fellowship. You'll come to church and they'll say, get out of your seat and greet one another. And you, you, you don't want to move. You don't want to move. And the Lord is trying to prescribe you fellowship because haven't you been feeling lonely? And haven't you been feeling forgotten? Don't you feel like nobody cares about you? Well, I came to tell you, you didn't come to church this morning. You came to the doctor's office and Jesus knows what you need. Oh, come on in to help your pastor. I, I feel good about this word this morning. He knows what you need. And so he prescribes it for us. Sometimes he prescribes us some correction. He's checking hearts. He's checking your height. He's checking your weight. And, and you're saying you want to change. And God says, if you want to change, then here's a little correction. <laughs> you, you need to change something about your life. You need to stop being so stubborn. You're not, you need to stop acting like the devil. <laughs> I don't like that. Then you need it. Here it comes. Because he's checking our height and he's checking our weight. Can I hear an amen? Amen. See, that's how he builds our faith. That's how he builds his disciples. He checks their height and he checks their weight. And then he begins to prescribe them what they need. When he was working with his 12 disciples, what did he do? He put them in a boat. He wanted to check their height and their weight. And when he found out where they were, he prescribed them a storm. <laughs> Some of you are going to get this on the way home. <laughs> He checks our height and he checks our weight and then he knows what to prescribe us. And for his disciples, he saw where they were. He knew where they were. He knew where he wanted to take them. So he let a, not a big storm, just a storm strong enough to stress them out. It wasn't like an earth shattering storm. The Bible in the NIV said it was a squall, Pastor David. I don't even know what a squall is, but that doesn't sound that big. It just sounds like a little swirling of the wind. But for some people who don't have faith, the storm seems bigger than what it really is. Some of you are going through storms right now. And it's like, oh, my God, Pastor Al, this is, a, uh, this is the big one. This is the one that's going to take me out. This is the one that's good. I'm going to have to throw it all in. I, I got a word for you. Uh-uh, baby, it's just a little squall. You'll be okay. The problem is, is that it's time for you to grow. It's time for you to come out of that same mentality. It's, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. I've been through that squall. It ain't nothing but a thing. Everything's going to be all right. 
Is this a good word? What am I trying to tell you? Jesus knows how to work with us. He knows what he's doing in our life. Tell your neighbor, he knows what he's doing. Look, there are three things that God uses to raise the faith of his disciples. And when I think about growing faith, I, I know for a fact that God has used these things in my life. I, I think I could say that when I speak about these three points, I'm going to give you very quickly and then send you home, is, is hope you, hopefully you go home different. Can I hear it? Amen. <laughs> but I know he's used these three things to build my faith. And, and I want to tell you, the first thing that God uses to build your faith if you're taking notes, write this down. Is God always uses places to build your faith. Places to build your faith. The Sea of Galilee was the place where the disciples learned many lessons about faith. It was on the Sea of Galilee where, where they faced the tempest, the squall, the storm. It was on the Sea of Galilee where they caught the fish. It was on the Sea of Galilee where Peter walked on water. So how many know that God... No, when he wants to build something in our life, he knows where to put us. In my journey of faith, there's always been places that God has used to build me. And I want to tell you, every single one of us has a Sea of Galilee in our life. What were some of those places that God used to build my life? Well, I could tell you right away, number one, the first place was church, the church house. That's why if you're here today and, 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 you, and you came to Victor Outreach, you were invited because someone you know, saw your condition or, or, or you were interested in the things of God and you said, man, I want to grow my faith. That's what I want to tell you. If you're here this morning, you're in the right place. This is a place where God will build your faith. Someone say faith. Church, church is, a, is a place where God built my faith. I think one of the primary things I had to learn in coming to church was I had to learn the whole concept of faithfulness. You're talking about a 19-year-old kid. When I came into the things of God, had no concept of what faithfulness meant. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. You, you weren't ever faithful in anything. I know at that time I couldn't keep a job more than six months. I got bored. I, 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 I slept too late to get up for work. Talk to me now. I was unfaithful. I couldn't finish school. Come on, somebody. And, and, and I, I couldn't even, you know, some of you guys, and I, won't, you know, I, I don't like to share about these things, but some of you guys couldn't even keep a girlfriend for too long. <laughs> Unfaithful. But when I came to the house of the Lord, the first thing they taught me, they said, if you want to grow, you have to learn to be faithful. Is this a good word for you? Yeah. And so when I came to church, I learned to fall in love with the house of God. I learned to fall in love with preaching. I learned to fall in love with singing songs. Say amen. amen. And I learned to fall in love with the concept of being faithful to something. And now I've been serving the Lord 25 years and I've developed a pattern of my life of not only being faithful to the house of the Lord, but I've been faithfully married to my wife for 21 years. I've been faithful to raising my children for 20 years. I've been faithful in my finances. I've been faithful, come on, in the ministry. I've got friends that I've been faithful to who have been faithful to me. Come on, somebody. When God wants to grow your faith, he always puts you in the place to grow your faith. What about Bible school? I know some of our young people, our young adults are in school. Oh, man, I learned a lot about Bible school, a lot in Bible school. Uh, 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 Bible school is a place where I learned something called discipline. Yes. Yes. Discipline. Bible school or college was a place that challenged my life. Challenged my life. You know, Teachers have a way of challenging you. The classroom has a way of challenging you. And it was a place where there's nothing more humbling than to work hard on a paper all night long, even if it's the night before. 
I'm still growing. <laughs> and to work hard and be all hyped up and doing all you can to get the test back or the paper back with a big fat F on it. <laughs> How many of that will teach you some discipline? What am I trying to say to you this morning is that when God wants to grow your faith, he always puts you in a place, and quite often, the place he puts you in is in a place that you're not usually comfortable with. I just got back from the East Coast, and I have great memories of the East Coast, living out there for almost four, well, four years, actually, doing ministry. I'm going to tell you, when I first got to Bridgeport, it wasn't the prettiest city. I've said this before. I don't mean, I don't mean to put it down, but I have to share the facts with y'all. Kind of gloomy place. And at the time, it didn't feel good. And how many know when you're in a place that you don't understand, you're not always going to feel good being in it? But I can look back today when I go out to those cities. Like I was there with my wife for seven days this last week. We we're in New Jersey, Philadelphia, all these cities that we travel, spend so many hours and days in, weeks in. And I can go back to those cities and I can thank God for that time. And I want to share something with some of you young people. In fact, a lot of you, when you get older and you begin to mature, you won't despise your trials. You'll thank God for your trials. I look at those cities and I begin to thank God. I, I rejoice when I go. I, I have a good time because God has grown me because those were places where God began to build my faith. When I was living in the East Coast, I encountered such things as unfamiliarity. I didn't understand the language. I didn't understand the lingo. I didn't understand the food. I didn't understand why the cities were so dirty. People come to San Diego and say, where's your church? I said, it's in the hood. It's in the hood. 42nd and 3rd and National. It's in the hood. This is the hood. This is the roughest part of San Diego. People come here and they laugh at me. They say, this is not the hood. San Diego is paradise. You haven't seen the hood until you've been in cities like Baltimore and Washington, D.C. and Newark, New Jersey and Bridgeport. You haven't seen the hood. Baby, you walk out here, this is beach. You're at the beach. Did you know technically you're at the beach? Come on, right? I thank God because in those places I learned how to encounter loneliness. And let me share something with you new Christians. If you want to grow, you need to understand there are going to be seasons where you're going to have to learn how to walk alone. Your family's not going to go where you're going. They're not going to support every decision you make. But I thank God that when I put my trust in him, God was always faithful and God took my faith to another level and he gave me my heart's desire. See, when you get into the place God wants to grow your faith, how many want to grow their faith? You encounter certain things in your life. I encountered the hardship of ministry. I encountered the hardship of my calling. But I thank God. It's because when God puts you in a place like that, it's a place where he teaches you to depend on him. Think about your squall. Think about the boat you're in right now. Understand that you're there because God doesn't want you to look around. God wants you to look up. And he wants you to know that he's the one to put you there. And he put you there for a reason because he's building your faith and he's growing you and he's taking you to the next level. Someone say places. What's the second place that God grows our faith? You get something so far? People. Is this too strong this morning? We're expecting. Is this okay? Is this on the money? Is this a good word? We're going to leave faith alone after this service, but, but I think we ought to talk about it. Someone say people. When God wants to build your faith, he not only puts you in a place, but he'll also bring some people in your life that he'll use to shape you. He'll bring some people in your life that he'll use to shape your faith. 
could bring some people in your life that will do things to you that make you feel weird. And I'm going to tell you, man, whenever God wants to take you to another level, he always brings new people into your life. And 99% of the time, when he brings those people into your life, they're going to start out by making you feel weird, and they're going to start out by challenging you, and they're going to start out by rubbing you the wrong way. See, some of you don't want to grow no more. You're like, I don't want to go. But how many want to go higher? How many want to take their faith higher? How many not afraid to be rubbed a little bit? He'll always bring those people in. And whenever God has wanted to grow me, he has used people in my life. And when I look at my journey of faith, I not only see places, like I mentioned, but I also see some unusual characters along my pathway. Amen. And let me tell you something, man. People are not always pleasant. People are not always pleasant. People can be thorny. I remember when I started preaching in this church years ago, I used to say, some of you are like porcupines. You know, when I hug you and then I walk away, all your spines are still in me. <laughs> How many know someone like that? Like every time you get around them, they're just telling you every problem in their life. And they put more burden on you. Come on, I hear an amen. Never have a victory story. Never have a miracle. Talk to me now. People can be difficult. They can be thorny. They can have attitude problems. They can be sandpapery. Ooh. Now, I know you're good now. You, you know, you're polished. So you see those people, you're like, oh, like, hey, how you doing? God bless you. <laughs> or I, I, you're like me. Sometimes you go into rooms and you put your head in first, like, <laughs> safe. Okay. Hey, how you doing? Come on, am I telling them, can I be real? Because you're smooth now, you're smooth now. Because you're smooth. Tell your neighbor, you're smooth. Because you learn that people could be sandpapery and thorny and rub you the wrong way. And I remember in my journey, man, I had a lot of people like that in my life. And you know what I would do? You know what I would do? I would pray because I'm spiritual. I'm very spiritual. I'm telling a joke. It was a laugh. <laughs> Let me pray for these unusual characters in my life. And what did I do? You know what I did. I got down and I began to try to pray him away. <laughs> Lord, get him out. Lord, take him out of here. I can't deal with it. this girl. She's I get to my nerves. Get this lady away from me. I'm not talking about you. I'm just saying there's people that you're like, is he talking about me? I'm not talking about you. I'm just saying I've been doing ministry 25 years. And you know what happened? I was trying to pray people away. You know where I'm going. And God didn't move them. He left them right there. I would pray. Say, okay, thank you, Jesus. I feel the peace of God. Walk back. They're still here. God, what's going on? I felt the peace. I didn't realize the peace wasn't that he was going to move them. The peace that he was that he was going to give me the strength to deal with them. And so he left them right there. Tell you never, he, left, he leaves them right there. Because God was using them. Here am I, watch this, here am I thinking I'm preaching to them. Here, I, here am I thinking I'm building them. Here am I thinking I'm raising them up. I'm, God's using me to shape them. But the reality is that God is using them to shape me. God is using them to build me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And when I was young, I hated it. I complained, I, I, I whimpered, I whined, I would talk to my wife and say, what is this? Sometimes it would be my wife. I would never pray her out, but she would drive me nuts and I would drive her nuts. But now that I'm more mature, I look back and say, Lord, thank you for keeping those people there because they made me into the man that I am today. 
Is there anyone here that could be mature? and give the Lord a mature praise and give the Lord a mature spirit of gratefulness that he left people in your path not to take you out but to take you higher in your faith and you are the person you are today because he left them there some of you won't clap it's cool but you know what I'm saying someone say people God leaves him there because he uses those people to build our faith. What's my last point? Not only places and people, but as the scripture shows us, how many know God knows how to work with our faith? He not only puts us in a place and not only does he use people, but lastly, perilous times. Perilous times. Three P's that will build your faith. They had a, a storm. They had a situation. They had a, a, a whirlwind that rose up. And let me tell you about it. It was an unexpected storm. And, and let me say something to some of you that are in an unexpected storm. You may not know why, but God's not surprised by it. Because how many know he knows how to build our faith? And, and an unexpected storm sometimes is the situation that God will use and God will sometimes catch you off guard on purpose. Mm. And, and, th- and you don't have to clap because you're like, I don't like it. You're like, Pastor Al, is this week going to be teaching every week? Well, I want to grow your faith. And how many want to grow? I only know the only way to grow is you got to know the truth. You really do. And, 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 and there's going to be some unexpected situations in your life. But how many know the Bible says that God will not give us something that we cannot handle? Amen. I told you a few weeks ago that you're never as strong as you think you are, but you're never as weak as you think you are either. Amen. And God allowed this storm to rise up over this boat to catch them off guard. They're called circumstances. And we can uh, describe circumstances as being unexpected events, something that springs up out of the blue, something, watch this, that hits you when you're not looking. Something that hits you when you're not looking. I'm a big boxing fan. I've, I've been going to fights lately. I love it. I'm taking every advantage I can to just be around fighters and be around, because I'm a fighter myself. And I like to get into the sweet science of battle. Can I hear an amen? And, and you can apply the physical battle to the spiritual battle. And they say this in boxing. Watch this. In boxing, they say, it's the punches that you don't see that knock you out. Not unless you're a champion. What am I trying to say to you? What separates average club fighters from decorated champions is that when you get hit with an unforeseen blow, That blow may knock you down, but you still rise up to win the fights. I'm trying to build your faith. And I've got a word for some of you that you've been hit by an unforeseen circumstance and you find yourself on the canvas of life. You find yourself in the corner and the referee is saying, are you okay? And he's giving you an eight count. He's saying, can you see me? Take a step towards me. Come on, do what I'm telling you to do. And you find yourself dazed. What's going to determine whether you're an average fighter or a champion is an average fighter quits when they get hit, but a champion knows how to take a licking and keep on I'm done preaching. A a champion knows how to take a licking and keep on ticking. And I came to tell you, you're going to be hit with circumstances. You're going to be hit with people. You're going to be in unfamiliar places. But God is raising up champions here in San Diego. And you're going to get up off the ground. 
Come on, keyboard player. You're going to get up off the ground. You're not going to throw in the towel. You're not going to give up on the marriage. You're not going to give up on the kids. You're not going to give up on the ministry because you have a champion spirit. You have the spirit of God living inside. Somebody needs to stir it up right now and understand that if God be for you, who could be against you? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Tell your neighbor, you're a champion. Tell him you're not a quitter. My God. There's three types of storms. Go and stand with me. I'm done. Did you get something this morning? You need that hour of sleep, huh? Tell your neighbor, you're a champion. And there's three types of storms. Watch. There's three types of storms that the Lord will allow in your life. He, he allows, number one, directing storms. Number two, he'll bring correcting storms. And number three, this is the one he brought to the disciples. He'll bring perfecting storms. Sometimes God will hit you with the storm because you're going the wrong way, buddy. He did it with Paul. Paul was going here. He hit him with a storm. He said, I don't want you to go here. I want you to go to this city. Go this way. Tell your neighbor, go this way. He'll hit you with a storm. He'll, 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 he'll close a job on you. He said, boy, I haven't called you to do this. He'll, he'll cause the company to go under just because you work there. He said, you're not going that way. Tell your neighbor, you're not going that way. He will redirect your life through a storm. Then there's the correcting storms. God will hit you with a storm so heavy that all you'll see is the flaws in your life. He'll hit you with a storm so heavy you won't be able to help but to see that rebellious spirit that you have. Just going against the grain all the time and, and never agree with nobody. And yeah, it was a good message, but no, but you're a rebel. Well, I agree with that. You're a rebel. You're a rebel. You have a rebellious spirit. That's why you never have joy and you never have victory because you're always negative. Is that too strong for you? I'm trying to help you. But then he'll hit you with the perfecting storm. It's just a squall. It's not there to take you out. It's there to see where you're at. It's a storm where Jesus is just checking your height and weight. And I'm going to tell you that when you get hit with a perfecting storm, you need to pass the test. You need to, ba- you need to pass the test. Tell your neighbor, pass the test. Because when these disciples freaked out, how many know someone right now? You don't have to point at them. Don't be like this. But you know someone right now that is freaking out over something small. Who knows somebody that they're freaking out? Like, like hey. Let's get Jesus is just testing your height and weight. I don't have the money for the women's convention. He's just testing your height and weight. How my bills going to get paid? He's just testing your height and weight. It's just a squall. It's just a little tempest. It's just a heart check. You say, well, how do you know? Where does it say it in the word? Okay, let me break it down for you. Because I know we have some collegiate people here. After the, he calmed the storm, the squall, Jesus was sleeping. It wasn't even strong enough to wake him up. He, the Bible says he was on a pillow. Like. He was more mad that they woke him up. Peace be still. It's like you when your kids wake you up over something dumb. You boy, you know I was in a nap and you wake me up for this nonsense. Little girl, haven't I told you don't be calling me when I'm resting? Is this is this good? 
and he wakes up, calm, storm. And it shows the difference in faith because he says, how is it that you're afraid? And then in, 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 in my version, the NIV says, how is it that you still have no faith? It's just a squall. But then these guys still didn't catch it. Because then they look at each other and say, oh my God. Did you see how much power he had to calm down that enormous hurricane? Where's your faith? This is your year for overflow. Increase. Favor. Multiplication. But you got to grow your faith. And, and when that storm rises, you're going to say, it's just a squall. I'm at a le another level now. And I want to pray for you today. I want to just open up the altar. We have about a minute or two. For anyone here that says, Pastor, that message was for me. And I want you to just come on and make a commitment that this year you're going to.